Hi everyone, welcome to these Python tutorials where we are putting special focus on image processing related tasks. We have been talking about deep learning terminology for the past few tutorials, so let's continue that uh, discussion by talking about te training, testing, and validation data. This may sound straightforward, like, oh, I know what training is, what uh, validation data is, but let's go ahead and make sure we all understand this the same way, because uh, uh, testing and validation could be a bit confusing, and also the role of validation data during the training often is confusing to many people. So let's go ahead and talk about this, and again, uh, quickly look at how we do this using uh, our Google Colab, code on Google Colab. So first of all, going back to this network, right? So how are we training it? We have a neural network. It could have uh, convolutional layers. I'm just showing you the dense layers here, but you have this network and a whole bunch of data is going in and training this network. So every piece of data that's actually going through this network where the weights are adjusted, that is actually your training data. Okay, so training data is pretty straightforward. So when it comes to training, training data is used to fit the model, that's it. What does that mean? We are adjusting the weights and biases uh, by looking at the training data and by definition, this is supervised mach uh, machine learning, right? By definition, training data means you have training images and labels. If it is just data, you have training data and corresponding labels, meaning X and Y. So when I say training data, that is both X and Y. X uh, in our example are images, Y are uh, classification or Y is segmentation or whatever the task we are trying to achieve, right? So how does the training happen again? Again, we talked about this many times. The uh, X goes in, right? Your input goes in and then your Y values from the training data whether it is, okay, a label in this example, like mitochondria, those Y values are checked against uh, uh, the ground truth. Whatever Y this calculates from the network are checked against the ground truth and you know what the error is. So training data includes your X and Y, both your uh, training images and the labels or masks, if you wanna call it. Okay, so the training data is used to fit the model, meaning adjust the weights and biases. And the model sees and learns from this data only. It just sees all of this data, and then it learns from this data. This is why we call this training data. And the accuracy gets checked and reported after each iteration. When you hit this, uh, when, you, when you run this model.fit, you see on-screen display, right? I mean, it says uh, uh, training loss and training accuracy. If you, if you notice it, it doesn't say validation loss and validation uh, accuracy until the epoch is done, right? So during the training, it only checks the training uh, uh, accuracy after each iteration, which means you load a batch and that batch gets processed, weights are adjusted, you get training accuracy. Next batch goes in, you get training accuracy. At the next batch goes in, how many times until the model sees the entire data and then you get the final accuracy for training for that epoch but then this gets continuously updated for validation it's uh, a slightly different validation data is the data that it's using only to evaluate a model during the training okay this is the data that it says okay i'm once the training is done in fact it gets checked and reported after each epoch it doesn't do it after each iteration. So after each epoch, it looks at the validation data and says, okay, now this is the ground truth for your validation data and this is what we are getting. And it reports the error or whatever the metric we are tracking, okay? Loss and your metrics that you are tracking. So that's what validation data is for. And common confusion is people think validation data is used as part of this training. Well, it's used only to check accuracy. The model does not update any weights or biases. That means it doesn't learn based on this validation data. It only checks the accuracy or whatever the metrics and prints it out on the screen. Why? Because the machine learning engineer, you, when you're uh, monitoring this validation error, you can look at that and say, oh, this is not doing good. We just did this in our last tutorial. We looked at the uh, learning curves, right? We looked at the loss. And then we said, oh, this is overfitting. Let me do something about it. So the validation data is there for us to take an action, whether it is getting more data, tuning our data, uh, pre-processing our data, or tuning hyperparameters, but validation data is there to give us some idea in terms of how the model is performing as you're training it. Okay, that's it. Now, test data 
is the data used to evaluate the final trained model. So test data is something that the model training or something, it, it, it never gets used there. Once the model is completely trained, this is the data that the machine learning engineer, which is you, you're going to check the accuracy of the entire model once the training is done. Okay, you're saying, okay, this is my test data, let me check it. Now, how should you actually have your test data? Now, uh, typically validation data is used as test data. We did that until now, right? I mean, until now we had, uh, we had, uh, for example, in our CIFAR data set, 60,000 data points, 50,000 for training, uh, 10,000 for validation. We kind of called it test data. And then we used it interchangeably between validation and test data. But in reality, the best way to do this, the best practice is to work with test data that represents generalized scenarios of future data. For example, in CIFAR 10, the goal is to identify uh, or, uh, you know, between 10 different classes. I think you have a truck and you have a horse. For example, the best way to actually get your training uh, testing data is just do a Google search for a bunch of horses and buses and trucks, and then uh, you know look at the license obviously, download them, and uh, use those as test data because those are so different from whatever you're using from CIFAR 10. That tells you how good your CIFAR 10 is capable of discriminating between these objects. Okay, if you're trying to put this into production mode, this is what you're supposed to do. So ideally, testing data should be uh, something that uh, represents generalized scenarios that uh, your application, if you're in, uh, again, uh, microscopy and you're training this on a bunch of mitochondria, your test data should be, okay, collect more data under a couple of other circumstances, right? Um, higher illumination or uh, changing your contrast or, you know, all the potential possible scenarios for your future image acquisition and then use that as your testing data. Ideally, you would also do that for training data, but uh, testing data, uh, it tells you exactly how good your model is going to perform if you have that. Okay, how are you going to split this? Again, we did this a few times. So from scikit-learn.model selection, we are going to import train test split. And when you split your data by supplying X and Y, right, you're splitting both your X which is uh, for images, it is images, and Y is your labels. Is it mitochondria? Is it lipid? And Y can also be masks if it is semantic segmentation, like image segmentation. So Y is ground truth, okay? So your X and Y, and then you define like how much of this data set should be part of your testing data set. So 0.25 is 25% of your data is uh, randomly divided into your testing, uh, testing data set. And when I say randomly, nothing is true random in nature. I mean, we are actually, we can actually select a seed like random state equals to 42, which means every time I run this line, I get the same split. This is very important if you want reproducible experiments. If you do not include that, then it's going to use a random uh, uh, integer every time. And then every time you run this, you get a different split different uh, and then your results change and you wonder why so i recommend keeping fixing this uh, random state okay so when you run this it gives you four outputs one is x train the other one is x test the first one is the training uh, data second one is tr uh, testing data for x the inputs and y train and y test right this is the training and testing uh, predictions or not predictions the the uh, ground truth uh, for, for, for your data. That's it. That's what it's giving you. And now the question is, I put 0.25 here like for my testing size. What is a good testing size? I don't think anyone can answer that clearly, but there are certain guidelines. So first of all, it depends on the type of challenge and the network. Like if you build a, such a deeper network that has millions and millions of parameters, uh, then uh, you probably need a lot of training and a lot of testing data and, uh, uh, and you have to experiment with what gives the best split. But there are some rules of thumb, right? For a large data set where you have uh, more than 100,000 data points, for example, then you have enough data for training, testing, and everything. So then I recommend dividing this into 70% training, 15% validation, 15% testing. It's not just uh, I, I mean, this is, this is the most common split that uh, uh, people try to do 70 to 30 or 75 to 25 is a very good starting point. Now for smaller data sets, okay, uh, anything below 100,000 or even, you know, uh, 10,000, 50,000, I think is uh, not too big. 
in general. So for smaller data set, consider using validation for testing, right? I mean, don't just do validation and testing because you don't have a lot of data. Uh, so, so you don't want to split, split your training data too small. That's the whole point here. So you probably would like to start with 70-30 split Okay, and if you, uh, why not 70, 15, 15, if it is going to be 70, because you need enough data points for validation. Otherwise, you probably see some overfitting effects. You want representative data for training and testing or validation all the time. Training and validation, you need representative data. So you can positively say how good your network is performing. Okay, that's why 70, 30 split between training and validation. In, in fact, you could even do 60, 40 split because having enough validation data is very, very, very important. Okay, that's why we are sacrificing testing and adding that to validation if we don't have a lot of data. Some people may say uh, 10,000 is enough data points. It, it completely depends upon uh, uh, depends upon your uh, your case. Like if, if it is 10,000 data points of some financial data, maybe. Uh, but if it is uh, 10,000 data points of uh, images that are in 10 different classes, maybe that's not enough. Maybe you need more, okay? So this is just a rule of thumb, okay? Now let's jump on to our collab just to quickly look at uh, what we mean and how we can actually do this, uh, do this uh, splitting. Okay, so here is our C4. Let's go ahead and connect this uh, uh, notebook to the resources okay there you there we are so now let's go down and run this uh, line by line i'll just show you a couple of lines we are not going to run the entire code but uh, first of all we are importing our data set here with uh, let it download with uh, 50,000 60,000 data points right 50,000 for x and uh, uh, i mean for for training and uh, 10,000 for testing so if this is the case, then you already have 10,000 for testing, right? So all you need to do is uh, get another 10,000 or so out of this 50,000 for validation. But let's say this is all we have. Let's, let's say our total data set size is 50,000, okay? So where do we go from here now? Uh, the first thing is here from scikit-learn model selection, we are using train test split. And then uh, my input, I call this X and Y right there. I'm not taking the testing side, only the uh, training data set, which is 50,000, right? So I'm splitting that 50,000 data points, both X and Y to 10%, like for testing and zero uh, is my random state. This is where, again, I, we already talked about this, so we can get reproducible results. So when we do that, 10% of that is going to be held as, uh, as uh, testing, you see? 5,000 for uh, testing and the remaining data set is 45,000. So even though it's a strain test split, I'm splitting them into some X data, like X1 and then testing. So first I'm splitting my testing, right? So I have 5,000 for testing. Now I need uh, some data for validation. So I'm gonna take my 45,000 remaining data points, okay? And then split them into 75, 25%. I hope that makes sense. This is for validation. Remember, I like to have 20, uh, 20, 15 to 25% for validation. So let's go ahead and uh, set 25% for validation out of this. And I'm uh, assigning the remaining for training. So what do we have at the end of this? About 11,000 for uh, testing. It says testing, sorry, it should have said validation. And uh, 33,750 for training. So after these two steps, I have 33,750 for training, 11,250 for test uh, validation and uh, uh, 5,000 data points for testing. And now I'll just go ahead and proceed with this. And if I go down, you'll see that I'm converting everything, the validation into categorical, uh, all the operations, obviously you have to do it uh, the right way. And now here I'm using X train and uh, Y train and for validation, I'm using the validation data. Okay, X validation and Y valid, uh, as you can see here. This is the, this is the, best practices instead of just not using testing as separate and uh, down here when i am actually testing the 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 results i'm using the test data set instead of validation data set okay and uh, uh, again uh, in this example i'm also plotting the confusion matrix so it tells me uh, for each class, class labels zero to nine, zero to nine, how many are correctly identified, how many are wrongly classified, right? So this is, all of this is done using the testing data, not the validation data. And validation data is used to look at the curve. And these are very nice 
curves, uh, as you can see, possibly because my model has some dropout, 25% dropout. And in the last video, we saw the importance of dropout anyway. Yeah. So as you can see, this is this is the best practice again. So I hope now if you have any doubts about training, testing and validation, it got a bit uh, clarified here. OK, so thank you very much. And again, uh, stay tuned for the next video where we are continuing this discussion. And until then, please do not forget to subscribe to this channel. Thank you.